androids, mutants, cyborgs, parasitism, alternate worlds, genetic engineering, hyperspace, positronic robots, telekinesis and clones. Now, so long as what you're reading has a bouquet garni consisting of two or three of those, it's a fair bet it's science fiction. But it's just, that's just scratching the surface. And to probe the mysteries of the craft further, we've been reading a new science fiction novel. It's by Ian Watson. And with its help, we hope to explore a special sort of inner space, namely the minds of those who write this kind of thing. Mr. Watson's book describes what looks like the ultimate journey, a jaunt by spaceship to heaven itself. But other practitioners have been reading his book too, and they are Peter Nichols, who's the editor of the science fiction encyclopedia I spoke of, Harry Harrison, one of the great names of science fiction, and, of course, with an appropriately lengthy entry in the encyclopedia. And Douglas Adams, who's something of a mutant in the sci-fi firmament, since he's author of The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a radio program and a book which add a dimension to science fiction that is both comic and domestic. So, first of all, I'm going to ask um, you, um, if I may, Mr Nichols, what did you think of Watson's book? Well, I thought it was a very striking theological thriller, and... Ian reminded me a little, it's as if he's going back to medieval f philosophy. He's sort of a, a Roger Bacon of the craft because he gets his physics and his metaphysics wonderfully confused. And I think this might turn out to be a, a rather good and generous thing to do to the science fiction field. What about uh, Mr Harrison? What did he think of the book? I'll be a bit crueler than Peter was. I feel that metaphysics doesn't belong in science fiction. That bringing in the elements of mysticism is a very big, grave mistake. So I'd like to speak a bit about that in the future. Right. Now, Mr. Adams. I think Ian's a superb writer. Uh, I think this is a very good book. If I was going to criticize it, I would say that, um, uh, as compared with his previous books, where Ian manages to work out the uh, wonderful uh, intellectual abstractions, which is a, a master at, in very concrete terms, um, here he works them out in abstract terms. I think what I miss in God's world is, is the feet of clay. Well, I thought that you, you made a very good stab at turning the metaphysics into actual physics, or uh, blurring the distinction, possibly, because you have a very good account of the, sci of the science of Satan. Not a person, not a thing, not a wicked entity, but an interface, as you pop call it, between reality and non-reality, which manages to work its finger, as it were, into the continuum and hold up the flow between life and death. So I would have thought that Mr. Harrison was somewhat wrong there about the metaphysics not having a place, at least in your book. But in the light of what you've heard your critics say, what would your response be? Physics uh, and metaphysics both have a place in science fiction. The earliest writers of science fiction uh, long, long ago, the proto-science fiction writers, were metaphysicians, really, asking what is it all about. And this large question, um, which is a metaphysical question, uh, what is the nature of reality, what is the origin of the universe, where is it going, is essentially a metaphysical, uh, philosophical question. But Mr. Harrison, you take it up then. He, he thinks, yeah. and I must say I agree with him, metaphysics well, well, has a place. Well, in a word, no, it had a place. Uh, we no longer have astrology, astronomy has replaced it. Metaphysics, mysticism, uh, are gone through. They haven't asked any questions. You, you speak in the book about a, um, an Arabic scholar, about um, the Ayatollah Khomeini, I think it was, who was a, a scientist. I can't face anything coming out of, out of that part of the world. I mean, Arthur Kessler in The Robot and the Lotus took care of metaphysics a long time ago, and it's dead and it's gone. We, we're not going to find the answers there. We're going to find it in another place. The other place is one you've ignored in that book. But what about the science of the matter? I mean, his proposition that really, considering an uncreated imagination of which this world is the imagination's only evidence of its own existence, that was rather a gripper, I thought. Well, um, dare I say, I've read it before. I'm, I apologize, ah. Ian. It's not an original idea. And I'm not trying to knock my dear friend here, but I wish he had uh, utilized his rather tremendous talents to discuss other items. We're, we're dealing with dead wood here, with, with ground been plowed over so many times, I couldn't see it being plowed one more time. Where did, it, where did this idea, uh, do you know, are you aware of this theme, Mr. Nichols, elsewhere, or Mr. Adams? Yes, I think it, it, in a way it goes back to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. I mean, I think modern physics ever since the 1930s actually has been weaving a kind of a great circle back to the old metaphysics because we can't, so to speak, have certainties of the kind that is a chair you're sitting on when it comes to the ultimate particles of the universe or how the universe defines itself or why the speed of light is what it is and so on. 
And I don't think Ian's invented this. I think this is simply a fact of modern physics, and it's a very good thing that science fiction should take note of it. Mr. Watson, yes. Well, this is one of the puzzling things about modern physics and science in general. Uh, science, which appeared to be uh, likely to explain the universe, said it uh, laid out cut and dried, um, 30, 40 years ago, uh, is now, in fact, c uh, converging upon metaphysics itself. Um, there's a very interesting book by a man called Capra called The Tower of Physics, uh, comparing Eastern philosophy uh, with um, Western science, uh, particle accelerators, and so forth, in which he suggests that uh, in order to arrive at a consistent um, picture of the total universe, we are going to have to move beyond a rational, analytical, uh, logical science towards a vision. And I think that science uh, itself, the cutting edge of modern science, is moving towards the kind of metaphysical insights uh, that have occurred in previous ages and been uh, apparently contradicted by science in its earlier stages, but which are now coming together again. What, we've come far enough uh, uh, for me to be able to ask you the question I admitted at the beginning I didn't know how to answer. What is science fiction? Can you sum it up? I just said a number of the things you might find in it. Can any one of you sum it for Mr. Well, Adams? Well, I'd like to take issue with what Harry said about what does and what doesn't have uh, a place in science fiction. I, I, I think it, I, I don't like seeing it lumped as, as a genre which has specific limits either side. I think, it, I think any issue has a place in any book if it happens to be what the writer wants to write mm. about. Well, it, it ha you can have those limits. Um, it is a separate field. It does exist by itself. We do not have conventions of, of Western readers or Jane Austen readers. We do have science fiction readers. We, we have a spectrum now. It's big enough that we have what you might call the Boone and Mills at one end. We have uh, uh, dragons and we have talking snakes. We have the other extreme of the quality of the upmarket end, which I hope you're attaining to and are certainly trying very hard and well, getting there any time. Get to your stage anytime. someday. Right. Uh, no, no, I wasn't <laughs> going to mention myself. <laughs> Brian Aldous, perhaps, is best. Uh, and King's Amos' book, The Alteration, that is the other end of the spectrum, away from the talking snakes. Now, when we have this spectrum, we are in a world unto ourselves. Someone said to me the other day that perhaps science fiction is taking over all of literature. And, uh, well, that's a frightening you idea to you. You could make a science fiction story about science fiction taking over no. the whole of literature. No. What about Mr. Nichols? What do you say science fiction is? Well, it's all the things they've said, but it, of course it's not homogeneous. So th there are different sorts. I mean, I suppose for most of our listeners, science fiction is, is equally Star Wars and Flash Gordon, by which, uh, which I mean um, the sort of the updated medieval romance, n knights and fair ladies in outer space. And uh, that's all jolly good, clean fun. But I do think that the, the cutting edge, to use Ian's phrase, of science fiction is in this realm of thought experiments about the future. I think science fiction actually is about our world. It conducts experiments about what could be and helps us to think the, the, w what is apparently in conventional fiction unimaginable. It's curious that it should have begun, if my information is right, in the so-called pulp magazines as though it wasn't a very taxing read. The way you four have been talking so far, it doesn't sound all that untaxing at this stage. The, uh, the well, the first editor of a pulp magazine uh, called Hugo Gernsback, uh, in fact, wanted to teach science uh, by means of fiction. Um, it was very much an educational crusade uh, <coughs> on his part. Unfortunately, most of the stories were, were dreadfully written. Uh, it's really when science fiction is moving back out of the early pulp, uh, which did have its origin in this desire to teach, to educate, um, back towards uh, certain literary values, um, a use of metaphor, a psychological insight and so forth, uh, that we are getting uh, this possible uh, taking over of mainstream literature by science fiction, which does, after all, take the hun whole universe for its province. Uh, after all, in, in science fiction, uh, you are considering that uh, not merely the psychological problems of a person who is isolated within a social and domestic situation, but also the fact that the very atoms out of which they are made have been cooked in the uh, ovens of distant suns billions of years ago uh, and billions of miles away. And it's this sense of the interaction between ourselves and the rest of the universe that I think science fiction can uh, deal with particularly well. And it can capsule this down uh, to a small microcosm, some th something domestic which is happening in the near future on planet Earth, or it can expand this uh, in space opera adventure format uh, right through the galaxy. Mr. Harrison said earlier that there was a special readership for uh, science fiction. Now, 
uh, I would feel that that readership, uh, and on the odd times it includes me, uh, this is how I describe myself, one who would be glad of the magic to happen, who, one who would, when we arrive at that particular planet, wherever it is, would be glad to find there were little green men there. Well, we have the dual readership there, the, the classic science fiction fan who has read it since birth, and the new readership. Why is it getting bigger now? Uh, the answer perhaps is very obvious. Science fiction is the only form of fiction that cares about the future. Any novel written today, a novel of, of personality, present and the past are the same. Science fiction is aware of the future, it aw is aware the future is coming, it's aware of change, and aware, most important, that you can change change. And maybe we're just shotgunning the future with ideas. At least we're talking about it. And it's what we all know about. It's what's happening day in, day out. Mr. Adams, I said rather unkindly, but I only meant to tease, that you were a sort of mutant in this, uh, <laughs> Jean. Um, I could imagine comedy might destroy the seriousness, and I don't mean solemnity, the seriousness with which this very proper Jean should be taken. Did that ever cross your mind? Um, I don't think so. I mean, I see science fiction as, as a very good vehicle for comedy, simply because um, it enables you, as it were, to turn the telescope the wrong way around on, on everyday experience. Um, suddenly see um, what might appear to us to be terribly important events as being terribly trivial and vice versa what we see as being terribly trivial is very important. Um, by taking everyday events and putting them on a cosmic scale you, I, I like to think that you sometimes um, shine a light on the everyday events. Well, you, that, stre that you stretch that comparison very far in your own admirable work, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, because there was one particular image where um, a high-flying notion was ultimately reduced to the medium in which it would best uh, take off, namely a nice hot cup of tea. <laughs> yes, well, um, uh, the, the, the thought behind that is that um, uh, as every piece of matter interacts on every other piece of matter, or, or, albeit in, in very, very slight ways. I mean, we can pick up, uh, we can pick up radio waves from <clears throat> the very, very furthest point on the galaxy, um, or, or indeed in the universe. Um, that in, in, in fact, be in the random movement of, of, of molecules in, uh, in, in a hot, hot <laughs> cup of tea, you are actually getting reflected virtually everything else that's, that's ever happened or yeah. is happening. Uh, and it's a little far-fetched, but it I think it's probably... Gentlemen, this is fairly unusual, isn't it, this particular well, conceit? Well, it is. It is. It, sci uh, humor is very rare in science fiction, unhappily. And it, there should be more of it, because you can actually handle the biggest problems with humor. Uh, <coughs> mention war. I mean, how many gallons of blood can you spill? How many intestines can you drape from trees before you're bored by it? By approaching war or death through humor, you get a much larger reality. And as I'm a firm believer in this, and uh, what Doug does. Mm. Well, I'd like to make a, a distinction between parody of the genre of science fiction itself, uh, which is, um, I think, th something that might appeal to science fiction fans because they know the genre and it amuses them, and parody of the universe, uh, which is, I think, what um, Douglas is getting at. Uh, one of the great books of science fiction, uh, Star Maker by Olaf Stapledon, uh, ends up with a, a cosmic intelligence, uh, a god, who is playing at making universes um, for his own amusement or um, in order to find something out. We don't know why. Uh, in a sense, uh, one reaction to the universe is it, uh, a very, it is a very serious place. Another one could be that it is a very comic and absurd place that has been set up as a large experiment. So in Douglas's book, uh, we have these, these wonderful imaginary titles uh, written by Peter Lowth in the Galaxy, 35 Great Mistakes That God Made, and who is this guy God anyway? <laughs> and that is um, parody of the universe, because this is one possible reaction to the universe. And the other thing, I think, is parody of the genre. Now, doesn't which Mr. Is Harrison go in for parody of the genre? Don't you, have you not in your day, sir, from satirized other practitioners? I have from time to time, de deliberately so, including myself, because w we shouldn't get too pretentious about this. We must remember always that this is a literature of entertainment. And if there's a fringe benefit of education, or mind blasting, or um, education to science, fine, I'm all for that. But at the same time, we have a number of dead old corpses swinging from the trees very lightly, you know, and they should be cut down. And I thought, it's very jolly good fun to do. I mean, one does appreciate it. And then Can I ask you it. this? You just, oh, sorry, you were going to say, Mr. Uh, I, I just wanted to pick up on a point that um, Ian was making earlier, which mm, I think relates to this. Um, he was talking about where physics and metaphysics meet. Now, um, I think uh, the, the, the brief of science fiction is, is no more than the brief of science in, 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 in dealing with little green men and, and, and so forth. I think that the, the brief of science is not merely to explain the, the action of an electron and a wire, 
but actually to find some rational expectation, uh, explanation for uh, the entire totality of one's experience. Um, and obviously metaphysics, anything we can think about or conceive, is, is enclosed in that and therefore is obviously the, um, the, the proper food of science fiction as y well. Your response to that, Mr. Nichols? Well, yes. <coughs> the odd thing about this is that science fiction, which is a very paradoxical thing and always has been, is in fact more than half in love with the irrational as well. And it has got very much the sort of the wish fulfillment thing. Can dreaming make it so? Can yeah. alternative worlds be constructed in the mind? There's something of that, in fact, in Ian's novel, which we began by talking about. I, I wouldn't like to see science fiction pinned down to sort of talking totally rationally about what exactly the future might be. It also throws up the most baroque metaphors in rather the way that a bark fugue might. Mm. In, your, in your encyclopedia, talking about metaphors, you, you've included lots of people, it seems to me, who uh, certainly aren't well known as science fiction writers, T.H. White, J.B. Priestley, uh, even Evelyn Waugh, although they've touched on it here and there. Mm. But I think your point is that they have borrowed uh, metaphors from the vocabulary or the, or the, practi uh, or, or the practice of science fiction. Oh, absolutely. I mean, Priestley was obsessed with travelling through time and undoing the wrongs one might have done, and Evelyn Waugh was obsessed with the end of the world. And, of course, British science fiction has never been quite the same as American, really? and where American has tended to look upwards and outwards and be on the whole rather wholesome, uh, the British science fiction has been rather preoccupied by, by decay and the coming end and everything going wrong and the empire contracting and so on. And uh, there seems to be something rather important in this. I think the British disease... No, no, no. I, I, I agree completely. They, uh, there are certain stories can only be told in science fiction uh, when um, um, on the beach need to be written. The only metaphor is a science fiction metaphor. If you're going to end the world with an atomic war, it has to be an atomic, a science fiction story. Let's hope so. Yes, I, I, I prefer so. Why? I was going to ask you, do science fiction writers and science fiction fans need to have a conference? I think there was one Maybe it's still going on, I'm not too sure. At Brighton. <laughs> Probably well, yeah. What's all that about? <coughs> and there's also something called a fanzine, uh, yes, which think, is fan it magazines. It's <laughs> a very well large <laughs> concern, as far as I can make out. I think one of the most important things about them is consumption of alcohol, isn't it? Uh, well, well, that does figure. I mean, you, you always say how many thousands or tens of thousands of gallons have been consumed. But I think but one inter well, the, the interesting thing about that <coughs> is that you, uh, I think in no other genre do you get the writers, uh, the critics, and the consumers all meeting together and discussing things. Uh, crime but why writers, would they want to, you see? Because they love the subject. They're absolutely they, passionate about uh, it. This the, is the the subject. That's like being them. buffs, isn't it? Or collectors, rather yes. than being but a branch of art. But literary buffs, isn't that a nice idea? People who actually spend their own money to go talk to authors. Yes, it is, oh I suppose. Yes. Mind blasting. It's, it's rather as though people gather together, Leonardo and Michelangelo and so forth, to have a discussion about their paintings and at the same time to knock back some vino. Would Leonardo or Michelangelo yeah. have gone? I asked myself. <laughs> ah. <laughs> Listen, is, would you say that the genre is uh, fundamentally subversive or conservative with a small c, of course. Does it support oh, what seems oh, to be here or does it seek to pull a mat from under? It's a very obvious answer. It's subversively conservative <laughs> no, in, in every that. way. Well, it is subversive of existent ideas of the fact that there's only one received idea, albeit the Tory party or the Catholic Church. There's always somebody in science fiction who will say, oh no, what about the other idea? It's conservative in the sense that it has a belief in mankind's perfectibility, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. something like this, an idea of perfectibility of intelligence, that intelligence rules, it, in, with all the exceptions we'll mention right away, of course, mm -hmm. but it contains both these elements. But I think that's the view of, of, of Harry Harrison, the writer. Of course. Um, and uh, th 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 that's him specifically. I think when, when you try and make generalizations about a genre which includes at the one end Flash Gordon and Dan Dare, and at the other end uh, Ian Watson or Kurt Vonnegut, then it's, it's actually very, very difficult to make any sort of generalizations about what the whole movement is about. A lot of it's Russians. A lot of Russians have written science fiction, of course, and uh, quite a few of them finished up in uh, prison camps. I mean, it is a way about talking, amongst other things, of talking about your own political system yeah. in highly metaphoric mm. and insulting ways. Mm. Andrei Sindyatsky was one. Yeah. During the McCarthy years, the only novels written that might say anti-McCarthy ideas were in science fiction. The other novels ran in great 
hordes, not to mention it. Yes. Mr. Watson. At the moment, in fact, various Russian writers are smuggling letters out to the West, writers of science fiction, um, complaining about what is happening to them there, because science fiction is a sub uh, subversive uh, genre. It asks questions about alternative social systems, alternative futures, and if you are stuck in one particular channel heading towards a future you have mapped out, you don't like the concept of alternative channels, alternative futures. Yet mm. these are ones that you need to consider if you are going to adapt to the future, if we are going to move into it and live there, because because otherwise, um, if we, we cannot achieve this flexibility, uh, then we might well come a cropper.